nihi noi ki te um, ki te fano, um, yeah, ki papatuanuku ra ko rangi noi um, tenara. It's awful when they make you cry before you get up. <laughs> um, it's a real privilege for me to be here, and again, thank you for your um, pofiri this morning. Um, you know, I really, um, I'm of this land, and I think that's one of the things that distinguishes um, those of us who are Pākehā here, is that um, I'm really aware that I am of this land. Um, I, I was born here, um, I travel a lot, and I'm always called home, and the home that calls me is the sea and the sky and the land here. Um, and you cannot take that out of us. Um, so, and I'm also really aware that even the Māori story is a story of immigration, and that I am very privileged to be able to be an immigrant in this land. Um, and so I just, I just really acknowledge all of you for welcoming us specifically to this land, but also for the people of this land who allowed my ancestors to be refugees here. And, you know, I'm really aware of that. I had um, dinner very recently and was sitting next to um, the minister who gets to decide how many refugees we take. And he, he told me that he was really willing to take refugees as long as they were Christian. And I said to him, um, you do understand that, uh, you know, you, can you imagine what it was like for, um, for Jews to come to New Zealand in the 1940s where their windows were broken and where they were not welcome? And, you know, and, and he kind of had that whole, but they've assimilated. And, you know, I just really, really, for the New Zealanders in the room especially, we have to open our hearts um, all of us are here at the privilege of the Tangata Whenua and we're here because our ancestors were looking for somewhere better. And so I just open with that because I'm really aware that I'm going to talk about something today that um, we have great affection for but is an immigrant. And, um, and one of the sort of soul-searching things I've had to do as a beekeeper um, is to really think about the balance between my little immigrant bees and the native bees. And so um, I'm, a, I'm a geek by nature, but I, I keep bees the rest of the time. And so I, I wanted to call today's, you know, a bees the new chickens. Um, and the reason I say that is I live in, a, in an urban area. Um, I, um, I keep bees in the city, and I also have five chickens <laughs> and a little permaculture food forest on about 300 square meters or something. Um, so I just want to talk about kombucha drinking hipsters because, um, <laughs> you know, I know. So we're all in love with the bees, right? And I make kombucha and I have a bearded son who could look like any of these lot. And, um, you know, and we all want to save the planet. And um, so I do just kind of want to invite the kombucha drinking hipsters who keep chickens to think about keeping bees. So, you know, bees are an interesting lot. Um, like us, they basically need two kinds of food sources, right? So we need, basically, we need protein and carbohydrate, yeah? And bees are exactly the same. So if you think about bees, bees need pollen, which is their protein, and nectar, which is their carbohydrate. And they don't always need it all at the same time. So you think if you're raising a lot of babies, those babies need lots of, carbo um, lots of protein. So in the spring, um, my hives are quite small, they've wintered over, they've you know, snuggled down into a little tiny nest, and in the spring they need as much pollen as possible. Um, and this is a picture of a native bee. Many of, them, many of you won't have seen native bees, or if you have you may not know what they are. And there's, there's quite a lot of species of them, but they're little tiny black bees and they're solitary. So when we think about the bees that we know from Europe or North America, those are the bees that live in hives, they're mass colonies, but the native bee is, is not. And when you think about coming from this windy place that uh, Lou's just talked about, a large number of the plants in New Zealand are wind pollinated, which makes a lot of sense, right? And as well as them being wind pollinated, they can be bird pollinated or bat pollinated as well as insect pollinated but the European plants are largely insect pollinated. And that makes a big difference to some of this thinking that we need to do about what we plant and how. Um, so I never knew I would get so deeply excited about the shape of a honeybee's tongue, okay? Um, I was gonna do you a whole presentation on the difference between a bumblebee tongue and a honeybee tongue, but then I thought, you know, it's a little arcane. <laughs> Gotta find the right audience for that. But when you think about the, I know. Um, <laughs> 
actually, I, I had a pile of bees die the other day and they all died with their tongues out, which I think is really interesting. So that is how they die. Um, so yeah, all those, you know, when we used to play cops and robbers or whatever as kids and you die, <laughs> that's exactly what they do. Um, so for the next slide, please. They are perfectly co-evolved for this little flower here. And, um, and they're perfectly co-evolved for a bunch of flowers that have very short access down a little throat to wherever that pollen or that nectar is, the nectar in particular. It's important for us to think about that because when you start to read the kind of save the bee stuff, often they forget about whether that's the difference between a bumblebee who has a much, much longer tongue <laughs> and a honeybee. Um, and I, I, Yusuf actually asked me to come and speak today about integrated agriculture. And I want you to think about the bees as this metaphor for integrated agriculture. So when we think about the UK, um, what's interesting is that a number of the bees we have in New Zealand have become extinct in the UK. And largely they co-evolve with clover, and clover is not so pro prominent anymore in farms as it used to be. And so the bees don't have the same forage as they used to. And I think we'll find the same in New Zealand as there is in the UK, which is that there is more biodiversity in our cities now than there is in our rural areas. Which is kind of weird, isn't it? But that is how it is for the UK, and I suspect it's the same here too. Um, I want you to think about, you know, I farm flowers. I don't, I, I keep bees at the pleasure of the bees. Um, but basically the way that I get bees to want to hang around my house is I, I farm flowers. And if we think about agriculture, or we think about long term for dairy, what we really need to be thinking about is farming the soil, farming the water, <laughs> you know, farming the plants that feed those animals, not just thinking, gosh, how many animals can I get per hectare? It's exactly the same for me as a beekeeper. The more I can plant the food for the bees, the more the bees will hang around where I am. Um, so I farm flowers. Uh, I have a very bolted veggie patch. So my mother um, eventually came round to the way that I garden, and in fact, she, when she died, she had this incredible permaculture orchard. Um, but, you know, for me, um, I, I recently... So this is this year's honey. This is like two weeks out of the hive. Um, I gave some to the Wellington City Council arborist, and she's like, can you tell me what's in here? And so this, this honey, which hopefully some of you will get to taste over the next sort of day or so, is a mixture of Pahutakawa, um, thank you Wellington City Council, um, the um, cabbage trees which my neighbours planted, um, mint from my garden, which is interesting. So we took this out to GNS and threw it under an electron microscope, it's pretty exciting. And, um, and then what we're going to call urban weed. Okay, so passion flower, which we don't really want growing in our gullies in Wellington. Um, wattles, so Australian weeds that are self-sowing themselves all over the town belt in Wellington. Uh, that little yellow flowered wild turnip. Um, my guys are doing their best to spread that. And you can see where I start to have some dilemmas. So there is a mixture in here of native plants and a lot of weeds that are also co-evolved with my bees. And You've got a bit of spinach in there. Um, I've made my place so attractive that um, I now have regular swarms of other people's hives turn up in my vegetable patch, okay? Um, and so um, what's really interesting to me is that I'd never seen a swarm until I became a beekeeper. And they don't just turn up anywhere in Wellington, they turn up in my garden. And they turn up in my garden because it's clearly an attractive place for bees to live. And so I did have a video, but I gave up on it. <laughs> um, but you might be able to see there, I've got a little box, and I, I literally cut a, cut a branch and foolishly shook it on my head, and 20,000 bees fell into the box via my head and um, moved into that little blue box that's there. This is their honey. It's now five boxes high. And we just took off 25 litres of honey from those guys. And they only turned up literally in my garden um, in late November. So, um, so one of the things I would think about when we think about agriculture and we think about, you know, these, these are a free range animal here. Um, they stay because they want to stay. They don't, you know, they'll go when they want to go. And we can think about ways to make it more attractive for them to stay, um, including the way that I beekeep. But in the end, I'm not going to keep them if this isn't an attractive place for them to be. 
So the New Zealand markets for honey are going through the roof at the moment. This is New Zealand honey exports. Um, we are one of the biggest exporters of honey in the world. And interestingly, we've just gone up another 40% year on year last year. Um, so this is a major crop. Um, now one of the things that's really important with that is you've probably all heard that the bees are dying. And there was a really interesting article in the Washington Post this week saying that bee numbers are up in the US. Now bee numbers are up globally, they're going up in New Zealand, they're going up in the US, but it's because of the work of people who are planting for them and who are doing it. And you know, when I think about it, sometimes it's really easy to be cynical, and one of the reasons I came in a way was we were at a seminar in Christchurch a few months ago, and I realised how, how tired you get. You know, you do 20 years on climate change or something, and you just get tired. Every now and then we need some good news, and bees actually are a good news story. Now, not a good news story in terms of how much pesticide's still going out there and, and the disease diseases that they're under attack from, but good news in the sense that individuals are thinking about them and starting to look after them in much better ways than we were before. And, and you know, we have a long way to go on this. Um, you know, we have a long way to go to really start to think about integrated health. So my neighbours, thanks to a bit of a bribe and the odd tour of my beehives, we don't have any neighbours who spray. Wellington City Council has made me a tree guardian so they don't spray my street. And slowly my neighbours and I are getting together to plant manuka and to plant things that will keep bees in our area. And of course I continue to bribe them with little jars of honey. So what you'll also see there is that New Zealand gets the, one of the highest prices in the world for our honey. So as well as being a major exporter, we get real value add honey. So clover honey is the cheapest honey you can get. And um, so somewhere between $14 and $45 a kilo um, is basically the range for honey. So Manuka is one that obviously gets a really high range. But also if we start to think about value add as well, so adding, adding honey into pharmaceuticals, into nutraceuticals, into cosmetics, we can end up with almost $1,000 a tonne, um, which is a very different kind of proposition if you come back to thinking about I farm flowers <laughs> um, than thinking about you know, what are we getting for some of our other agricultural crops. Now, I'm not saying we should all pile into honey, right? But I want us to think very carefully about you know, what, is the, what are the longer processes? What is it that we are growing and harvesting and able to sell as New Zealanders in the world market? And one of the big issues that we have at the moment in the beekeeping community is less and less beekeepers want to do what's called pollination work. If I have to send my darlings <laughs> into, a, um, into a, a, an orchard and they're going to spray my bees, I really don't want to do that, right? I really, really don't want to risk... I mean, they're, they're my family in that sense. And so what's happening is that more and more of beekeepers in New Zealand are seeing the price of honey and saying, well, I'm not going to put my hives into your avocado orchard. I'm not going to put my hives into your kiwi fruit orchard. And so there are two kinds of pushes and pulls for the pesticide work. We have to have pull-through demand from the consumer, like you, saying, I, I want real food and I don't want um, pesticide in that food. But then also, long-term, we'll find that we don't want to be part of that whole industrial cycle either. Um, so I'm a geek, so I like to use tools. And some of you may have been at Nature Hack, and I inspired a team at Nature Hack to start mapping um, bee habitat, because one of the things, I, I'm an open data fan and I've been working in big data for 20 odd years, and um, I work a bit with the Ministry for Primary Industries and I also chair the Land Information Service. So, you know, I was pulling some material from DOC together with material from regional councils together with f information for, that I could get from the Ministry for Primary Industries. And what I found is some of this balance between what we're doing with natives and what we do with exotics really important. So there's a New Zealand native called Tutu, which is a fantastic nitrogen fixer, really great for putting into incipient gullies, really good for erosion control. However, um, as a beekeeper, if that, um, the, basically there's an insect that grows on it, sucks the sap out, makes honeydew from the sap, bees come along, collect the honeydew, turn it into honey, neurotoxin for humans. So kind of a slight, one of those disconnects again, right? So what we've got is that I managed to put together some maps that showed where regional councils are encouraging people to plant tutu, tutu. And at the same time, we've got Ministry for Primary Industries funding people to plant manuka so that we can have more bees. 
And we've got this kind of sometimes little look at joined up thinking and how we do that. So one of the things I'd invite you to think about today is how we can, as technologists, as many of you will be, how we can use our technology skills to help some of these ancient arts. Not to kind of make them more geeky, but to really use things like GIS tools to help us to plan where we can put bees and how we can encourage people to plant the right forage. Oh, so that was my house, which apparently is a number three perfect place to put um, hives. I don't know if you've seen this. These are Fitbits for cows. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about um, precision agriculture, and I'm also quite active in the Internet of Things, you know, um, kind of quantified self movement. And I think it's really interesting that we can do a whole lot of work now around Fitbits for cows. Um, and what I'm looking for is, you know, the sort of hive data that I want um, would be great around, um, like, what's the weight of my hive? So I can tell then if honey is coming in. What's the humidity of the hive? So I can tell if they're drying honey off. Um, what are the flight rates? Um, what are the temperature? And um, the, basically, they keep the hive at a constant temperature all year. And then last thing is the kind of drone to worker ratio. So I can see kind of how the whole sentiment of the hive is and what they're up to. Um, you know, these are things that would be very, very simple for us to do with technology. And so I, I'm quite excited about how we can use technology that is not chemical technology um, in order to improve both beekeeping and bee health. Um, so, so I wanted to um, just quickly talk about sustainable harvesting, but before I do that, oh, I just want, I was going to bring a frame out here, um, and there's nothing like working with bees to get humbled, right? So I was going to bring a, a frame of hive to show, um, of honey to show you. So I opened up the hive yesterday, it's really, really windy, and the bees hate wind. Um, I can barely move this arm, I think I've got about 20 stings in this arm, and I, I've got really good at knowing, you know, when I piss them off, I clearly piss them off. And so I retreated and thought, well, I'll wait till this morning, and of course this morning it's bucketing down. Um, but this is basically how I harvest honey, with a knife, in a kitchen, with a colander. Um, and then I take it round to my neighbours, or they come over and help me press it through. And um, so I just wanted to mention the Flow Hive really quickly, because I know a lot of people are excited, and because I'm into technology, people constantly send me the Flow Hive. Um, what I would say about the Flow Hive for me is I'm really interested to see how it goes. However, the problem it solves, it seems to me, is two things. One is kind of kombucha drinking hipsters wanting to figure out how to save the bees. We should do that, right? We should absolutely do that. Number two, the thing I'd say that it solves is it makes honey extraction look really easy, like, like you just turn a tap and there's the honey. And uh, if this hive had bees in it, you'd have 40,000 bees on their heads at this very moment, right? So this is clearly a hive that they've taken away from any bees to an area there are no bees. Um, and you can see in the privacy of my own kitchen with a hot knife, it's really not that difficult, okay? And bees make their home. You cannot, like even, I don't even know if you could use the word bee as a, in a singularity. A bee is a social being. Um, they make their own wax, they live in the wax, it is their home, they don't need us to build plastic homes for them. All right, last slide. Um, thank you. So a few principles. The bees know better than me, right? So they know how to make their homes, they know how to make their hives, they don't really need me to mess around with them. Um, that doesn't mean I can't use technology to help that, but it's real simple technology, the Internet of Things technology. Plant strategically. Go wild. Let your, you know, your spinach and your mint go to seed. They really love that. Get a no-spray neighbourhood. Be a really good neighbour. You know, my friends, my neighbours come for dinner. We give them hives, um, give them honey. Like, be a good neighbour to people. Register your hive with MPI. It really worries me that with so much disease around, we need to manage that. We need to know where they are. Um, a box for the bees is do not be greedy. So we leave a box on for the bees. Our bees don't need to be fed sugar. So if you think about colony collapse, most commercial beekeepers feed their bees sugar in the winter, and it's only because they've stolen all of their food source, right? And then they give them shitty carbohydrate, and they wonder why they die. Ugh. Um, and then the data helps. And one very, very last slide. Um, plant flowers, farm the soil and feed for our stock, raise food, and the side effects are that you get beauty and tomatoes, even though they're from the bumblebees, because they come and steal the... the um, pollen, 
And the very last one is just don't forget, just like the bees, we live in a community and that community needs to be nurtured and looked after and food is one of the best ways we will nurture our local communities, not just, you know, a, a global one. Thank you. <laughs>